Welcome to chapter six, the chapter that we'll be talking about relationship marketing. And what you need to understand about the principle of relationship marketing is that this is a relatively new, and by relatively new we mean 20 years, principle inside marketing that has been quite controversial. Now, when this was first brought out in the mid 90s, we had a split in the marketing academy. In the, it was referred to as the Scandinavian or the Nordic School. These, and the Australian and New Zealand Academy went with the Nordic understanding that relationship marketing meant trust, commitment, and reciprocity. It was about a long-term engagement with a client and that these long-term engagements came with a series of principles. In the US, we had uh, the Berry, Leonard Berry, the Berry School, who defined relationship marketing as being direct mail and database marketing. So in the US, relationship marketing was seen as big data, analytics, directed mail outs, offers, brochures, and coupons. This came to a head as a significant clash of understanding and ideology in 2004, when the American Marketing Association revised their definition of marketing. Now their team that were led the revision included Robert Lush, who are uh, of the Vargo and Lush fame. Lush's work in, well, across academic marketing, he was familiar with the concept of relationship marketing as being from the European version. So he was looking at this as the core premise of marketing was ongoing relationships and the building of loyalty. When the AMA released their definition in 2004 and put that the role of marketing was to benefit, to create relationships that benefit customer and organization, the inclusion of relationship marketing into the definition sparked a huge controversy in the American Marketing Association's practitioner group because the practitioners understood relationship marketing to be direct mail. And so there was this huge outcry as to why is direct mail now elevated being the core of what marketing's premise is. This actually is the reason why we went as a collective uh, marketing academy from one definition in 1985, a revision to that definition in 2004, and then an immediate revision in 2007, it was because there was such a resistance to the way the 2004 definition raised a term which was meant to mean ongoing relationships and customer loyalty, and was interpreted as direct mail and brochures. So, even something, when we start talking about definitions and we start talking about technical terms, this is why when you're doing things like assignments and exams, when you first use a particular technical term, you spell it out so that we're all on the same page and we're all in agreement, or at least I know where you stand and what you mean. In the case of the AMA, where they use the term relationship, the definitions committee thought they meant loyalty, brand loyalty, and ongoing exchange. And the practitioner community thought they meant brochures. So you've got to spell it out. You've got to make it clear the first time you use it. And this is why we ask you to use definitions, why we ask you to use citations, so we know whose ideas are influencing you. And also so we can go back and look at, say, well, okay, if this was, you were to use a term that I was unfamiliar with and you cited where it came from gives me the chance to improve my knowledge and expand my understanding. So what we want to do with this chapter is we want to bring up a couple of concepts. Probably the most important one is the idea that the customer is not always right. Relationship marketing's central premise of reciprocity means that you and the customer need to both be getting a beneficial relationship. If the customer is not a beneficial customer for you, you are not obliged to continue servicing that customer's needs. The customer may be wrong. The customer 
may be the wrong fit. The customer may be there to just try and take you for everything you're worth, in which case you should get rid of that customer because that is not a positive relationship. And that's a relationship that draws also, if it's a relationship that draws a lot of your resources for very little return, that customer is detrimental to your other customers. And this is one of the critical areas to understand about segmentation and relationship marketing is that if you are solving the problem of a group of people and one person takes up resources that could be shared amongst the many, you need to consider whether that problem being solved with an excess deployment of resources meets your organizational goals and needs. And it may be that, in fact, the one person who's drawing a lot of your time and a lot of your effort is, in fact, the least loyal, the least useful, and is detrimental to the whole provision of serv the service you're trying to administer that's of benefit to a larger group. So you're not obligated to keep a customer who's not a good customer. The other concept out of here is that you're going to be pushed back to the textbook to look at the calculations on things like customer lifetime value because there's an actual strong mathematical basis to calculation of value and relationship. And there's a whole bunch of conversation that we have around trust but we start looking at trust as this particular way of seeing it as a calculative process. What is the value of trust to us as an organization? Because we are now, again, thinking as marketers, we're thinking as a company, we're thinking as a corporation. And corporations don't have feelings and emotions, corporations have calculations. No matter what the US Supreme Court says, corporations are not people. So, a relationship, basically, the controversy that came out when this was uh, really brought to the fore in the 1995-96, uh, when I was learning my trade as a marketer, I was on the transaction marketing point of view. I just want to be clear about this, is I did not start with team relationship marketing. I was not convinced of its benefit, and I still believe that there is a very strong role for the transaction where you don't want an ongoing friendship, you don't want offers and loyalty, you don't want loyalty cards and sign in and log in, you just want to buy the product and leave. So re the relationships should be able to be one-offs. But the principle of relationship marketing is that you want to use the Ansoft matrix, you want to sell more products to existing customers. Relationship marketing is either a defensive mechanism from the GE Finance Matrix, where you are trying to secure a market by retaining customers, or it's a growth mechanism where you are trying to sell more products to existing customers or sell new products to existing customers. Fundamentally, you need, for those two growth strategies, for the Ansoft Matrix growth strategies to work, you need to be retaining customers. The emphasis very much is on re the retention. So we're looking at multiple purchases, we're looking at brand loyalty, we're looking at an idea that loyalty does not create discounting beyond the point at which discounting is a defensive mechanism. We use discounting to prevent people from being lured away by price offers, but we don't use discounting to decrease the value of a customer. So what do we want to do with relationship marketing? What are our goals here? Step one is we want to acquire a customer. So that is an existing product or a new product to a new group of customers. Once we have that customer, Using the services marketing approach, what we're looking at here is ensuring that we're hitting the zone of tolerance. So we're getting the satisfaction. We're inside their zone of tolerance. Then we want to retain that customer. We want them to have an outcome that reduces their desire to search for alternatives. Now that can be through satisfaction, that can be through the creation of loyalty, that can also be through the creation of exit barriers. Facebook is particularly strong at creating exports and exit barriers because if you want to leave Facebook, you have to take your friends with you. 
and your friends will have to agree on the new common site that you're all going to use to stay in touch with each other. So retention can be positively framed in terms of you get a lot of value, or retention can be framed negatively as the cost of leaving exceeds the benefits of leaving, but that's poor marketing. If you're retaining through the cost of leaving is too high, then you're not going to encourage that person to use more of the existing product. You're basically only denying those customers to another market. The final step is the enhancing. And the enhancing in this is to see the role of the customer as a member of the organization. So the customer can become both co-producer, a proxy employee, can be a word of mouth advocate, can be a brand advocate, can be a problem solver. Particularly where you're looking at situations where customer innovations and use innovation enhances the value of your product. The relationship marketer's role here is to get the customers to the point that they will give away their enhancements of the product to other members of the marketplace to make the product more valuable without you doing anything other than just simply supporting or not actively opposing them. So what you want to be looking at here and something like the, so the typology here is we've got a bunch of technical uh, ways of seeing the world. So the customer is a stranger, an acquaintance, a friend, a partner. And we're thinking about that as four tiers of the relationship here. So even we look at this in terms of acquire a stranger, satisfy an acquaintance, and so forth. We have a series of marketing activity to think about. Each of these boxes represents a decision frame. So the customer as the product, customer as a stranger, you think then of the product offering you're going to create. You are basically trying to use relative advantage, you're trying to be better, you're trying to come up on that person's search radar as a superior alternative. Why would this person come to you? Well, your product has a level of attractiveness. You are enticing someone to your product. What is it that the customer does? Well, it's about interest, exploration, it's trial. You're at innovation adoption theory here. So you see B grounding is innovation. What is it that you're trying to do? You're trying to get someone through the door to try the product. So you're looking for trial adoption you've got no operational relationship with this customer because they're a new customer. And here's your challenge. How strong is your competitive advantage? Well, it's not. Your competitive advantage is that your product is attractive. If your product doesn't satisfy that person, they'll try it once and then they'll reject it on full information. So what do you want to do with your marketing at this point in time as a relationship marketer? This is recruitment. This is about getting the customer in. So you can see here that the type, the important thing here is that you need to be thinking about these four segments as different segments that may exist within a larger marketing segment. So when you are thinking about your segmentation strategies, you want to be thinking not just Geography, demography, psychography, you want to be thinking, what stage in the relationship cycle are we at? Because someone who is a partner, someone who has been with your organization for an extended time, so they've got a long relationship history with you, they have the same demographic profile as a stranger, but your marketing message is completely removed if you are trying to go and enhance a relationship with a customer versus acquire a customer in the first place. If you've got a customer who's up at the point of being a partner to the organization, you're doing customization, there's individualized offerings. You have got a deep understanding of each other. The customer knows you and you know the customer. So deeply personalized messages are really helpful. Whereas if you've never interacted with this firm before, and it greets you by name, and this is a problem that um, a lot of online marketers were having, 
is that they were drawing using cookies on their website to draw down your Amazon information. So if you were logged in at Amazon.com, you would go to this new website you've never been to before, and it would greet you by name. And you'd be sitting there going, I've, how do you know that? That's really creepy. And it was creeping people out, and they were quitting websites. They were going in to find out shopping carts partly pre-filled up their information. They're like, who are you and how do you know this? When they were strangers to the site. Whereas if you've got a relationship with the site and you've elected to save your information, then having that shopping cart just need to verify with the passcode and all your uh, details and information are stored there is brilliant. That's trust and that's satisfaction. But it's not something you start with. So you've got to be mindful that you still need the transaction to get the stranger into acquaintance. And they need to be satisfied with the transaction to go stranger to acquaintance. You can't simply start at acquaintance or friends with your initial relationship marketing. Because you need to create the transaction that lets you demonstrate the satisfaction. The satisfaction over multiple times will build the trust. The trust and the satisfaction together will make you think, well, it's worth going all in with this group. It's worth being loyal because I'm getting something here my commitment then becomes a mutual exchange of benefit. As commitment creates loyalty, loyalty creates purchasing, repeat purchasing, word of mouth. But the loyalty aspect comes, and the commitment aspect comes, because both sides find value. So at 6.1, what you would do with a table like this is that you would want to use it as a means to think through decisions. You want to use it as a decision making protocol to go, I want to ensure that I've started thinking through this and when I'm looking at putting my relationship marketing strategy together that I run down a line, a column here and go, okay, this person's probably around about friends, have a differentiated, am I emphasizing trust, what am I doing here, have I thought these elements through? It's not an exhaustive list, but it's a comprehensive list. If you've answered the questions on here, if you've thought about each of these boxes, you're in a good position to at least be able to adjust if you've missed anything. All right, so let's talk about relationship marketing from the customer side. What we need to appreciate is that relationship marketing needs to be a two-way process. There is no one-way relationship. If the customer is not receiving benefits, the company is not doing relationship marketing. It can be doing a lot of other things. It can be doing stalking. It can be doing a whole bunch of very negative things. But if the customer isn't getting an increased level of trust, you are handing over an enormous amount of personal data, preference data, and information, that should, I mean, that can raise your anxiety level. You know so much about me. But if that's beneficial, if they can see a result that's positive here, that will reduce the anxiety and increase the trust. The creation of confidence reduces purchase anxiety, reduces cognitive dissonance. Loyalty also gives you familiarity, gives you the opportunity to do things like brand advocacy, be part of brand communities, be connected with others who are similar purchasing patterns, who like the same products, and this is the fundamental basis of fandoms, whether they be a sports fandom, whether they be a music fandom, a TV fandom, the, comp the loyalty, the relationship. And the other aspect of relationship marketing is that there are the ideas that there should be some reward for loyalty. And that is either in special deals, and those special deals can be access. They can be access to information, they can be early access to products, they can be access to community, to behind the scenes information. They don't necessarily have to be financial special deals, they can be special arrangements. There are also, an ex there's an expectation that there would be some degree of loyalty pricing arrangement. But again, you can also look at this from the point of view of, as an ongoing relationship, you can offer more expensive packages 
that get better privileges and better perks. If we take, for example, uh, airline travel, the ultimate relationship card is your frequent flyers card. The longer you are with an organization, the more you fly with that airline, the more likely you are to get special arrangements and special price breaks. But you're also going to be enticed into higher priced operations. So if you're flying um, out of a 365 day a year, you've got 180 flights booked in, you are traveling all over the countryside, you're moving every second day, then you're going to rack up enough frequent flyers to get moved up into the top tier bracket. But you're also at the same time going to be being enticed towards the premium offerings. So this is how it works. The special deal is, look, we'll give you a discount, but we'll give you a discount on business class. You travel economy for 100 days, we'll offer you 25% off business class. Slightly, make it slightly more expensive than economy still, still getting your margin, but improving the perception, improving the performance, creating the loyalty so that when they come round to constantly buy business class, you can sell them first class. So, as I said, relationship marketing has got to be two-sided. Customers have to get benefits, firms have to get benefits. Now, the benefit for the firm is often economic. So we're looking at loyalty buys you. If you've got a loyal customer base, they're going to buy your product. So that's the first thing. Sales to existing customers is a growth strategy, but it's also a revenue strategy. You have a market, you sell to that market, that's your revenue. That market knows you, you can spend less, you can put less emphasis into recruiting that market. You still need to put emphasis into recruiting that market, into retaining that market. It's really important to note that the special treatment benefits also include respect. You can't take them for granted. And this is where relationship marketing fails, is where people assume loyalty is rusted on and loyalty doesn't need to be maintained. So if you're not also servicing and maintaining that loyal market, you'll lose them. The customer behavior, the benefits you get from having loyal customers, strong word of mouth, the voluntary performance. Customers get to the point that they know the protocols, they know the services, they start picking up, particularly in services, they pick up the slack on your side. Uh, they can also mentor other customers. So if the number of times that as a brand loyal customer, I have given advice to other customers. And this and told people what to expect or help them explain something. And you do it in the classroom. You do it when you're at the ANU. You're all customers of the university and if you find a lost student and direct them around or talk them through or you're in a senior year, you mentor a junior student, that is, you know, you've been on campus now, this is your fourth semester and you know you've got someone new and you mentor them, that is, the customer loyalty behavior. And that's one of the benefits of having a loyalty is that your customers work with you. Lastly, the HRM benefits of relationship marketing is that you are actually looking at treating customers with respect. Employee retention is something that if you are in a heavily transaction sales, consequence don't matter, focused environment, you turn over your employees as well as turning over your, your customers. Where you have demonstrated that keeping customers is valuable and viable and that you can see a long-term future, you're also wanting to keep the staff the customers have worked with and the customers like. So you look at this in terms of you want to retain the employees because their knowledge of the customer is valuable to you. So you value your employee. All right, this is the uh, loyalty exercise. We'll have a bit of a chat about this in the seminars. But I just want to draw your attention to it. Do give it a, a look over in terms of what are the facets that create loyalty for you? And what are the, now at this point, what are the theories? How does that personal co consumption behavior, how do you explain that using the services marketing theory of this chapter?
All right, a couple of models to uh, point you through. I'm going to draw your attention to the customer pyramid. That we have different levels. We have a certain type of customer who is referred to here as the lead customer because they are the weight that drags you down. They're not, you quite often will retain them because you don't want some upstart startup company coming through and taking out these customers. But at the same time, you don't necessarily want them because they cost you time and money. The iron and the gold, the iron level, they are valuable. Iron is a useful and valuable ore, but they don't merit special treatment. They are repeat, but not loyal. They are recurring, but not relationship. Gold is where you've got a level above recurring. They're frequent buyers, they're frequent purchasers, but they're not your most profitable units. At the platinum level, they are worth the money. So again, what you want to be thinking about this and a model like this in the customer pyramid, the table, is this is a segmentation tool for segmenting customers you already have. So you want to be looking at them from the point of view of how do we utilize a customer base that has a platinum tier, a gold tier, and an iron tier. The lead tier in this case, they are costing you money or they're costing you time. They are taking resources and they're problematic. So you want to try and get rid of them or you want to convert them to the iron tier. At the iron level, they are the volume, but they're nothing, uh, they're not nothing special, but they're nothing discreet to be uh, engaged with separately. They are looking at you need them, they are your base, but they're not going to also, they're probably not going to respond to a lot of the loyalty incentives. They don't have a particular desire to get that loyalty engagement. Gold are profitable, but gold are also hedging their bets, so they're not completely committed. And the platinum is the one where you have the closest working relationship. So, what are we looking at when we're trying to create relationship marketing? Well, what we have here is a, a bit of a dream team uh, lineup, actually, if you've got Stephen Brown and Gremler on the same article. The model here would be a structural equation model. This is a theoretical model and a conceptual model, but you'd be able to measure it as a structural equation model. What you have in terms of your uh, model is component parts that are indicative, but also a bit of a checklist. So the driver of a relationship is a switching barrier. Does it cost to change? Does it is inertia uh, positive? Uh, is just simply carrying on as you always have done an acceptable thing? The core service provision is bringing us back to the gaps model: satisfaction, perceived quality, and perceived value. The bonds are a new element here. Financial, social, customization, and structural. Particularly, pay attention in detail to the social and the customization bonds. Particularly with e-marketing, financial bonds are really easy for opponents to compete on with price matching and price customization. It's the social bonds, it's the personal loyalties, and the customization bonds. You know, I know their product offers, and I know their quality, and the company knows me, and the company lets me set and lets me customize, and the company knows my problems and can solve them. This is particularly strong in business to business. Customization bonds are one of the biggest drivers of business to business relationship marketing because the two companies become codependent. If I am making a custom dice game where I rely on a series of custom built component parts, I need that company that I'm buying my custom stock from. At the same time, the custom stock that that company creates is of no use to any other customer than me. So we've got a close working relationship. It's a very strong driver of a relationship. That also depends then you create, particularly in customization, you create very strong bonds based on trust and a strong bond of commitments. The reciprocity is both of us 
making certain we come through with our sides of a bargain. And finally, the outcomes. So we want to look at this in terms of relationship marketing should be considered strategic and tactical. Are these benefits useful for you in acquiring and retaining a market? Do the customers want these benefits? If so, then you should use relationship marketing to reach those customers. Obviously, on your side, you want the money, the uh, behavior, and the HR benefits, but you want to be thinking again, what's the value of engaging this? Is this value perceived by my customers? So, mention a bit about these. Go into depth in the text because they can be strategies to uh, pick up. It's something we'll talk about in the seminars because I think this would be a really interesting area to talk about it from the point of view of when are they useful? And the last thing that, um, again, with the relationships is that they are tiered and they are built up. So you can start with, I am loyal to this company because I get a good price. I am loyal to this company because I like it. I am loyal to this company and its relationship because we work together. And I am loyal to this company and this relationship because we are codependent. Finally, the last thing I want to mention is customer is not always right. Uh, this is the principle of services marketing that operates. It's also, just so you know, the principle I support because I am frequently the wrong customer. I don't fit a whole bunch of products that are mostly aimed at me because I'm the wrong customer. I'm not the right segment. I don't have the right needs. I'm not profitable in the long term. I'm a marketer, so I'm very aware of various loyalty and pricing strategies. And basically, the wrong customer is not the one that you want to retain. So you go look at protocols for getting rid of a customer. How do we remove difficult customers? How do we sack a customer? Because the question is, should firms fire their customers? And the answer is yes. So that covers the pre-recorded lecture for the, uh, this season. If you need me for anything, either across the Twitter account or on the email, relationship marketing is a huge area. This is uh, one chapter that covers 20 years worth of dedicated research and a whole lot of material exists outside of this. So if you are interested in relationship marketing, hit up Google Scholar. There's a lot of stuff out there.